So we're ending our guest, um, our, our summer series where we've had a, a number of guest speakers come in through the course of the summer. So this is the last week of that. And I couldn't think of a better guest to bring in than a good friend of mine. Would you give him a warm Journey Church welcome? His name is Jeff Looney. Would you welcome to the stage? Jeff and I have known each other for going on 10 years or more now, and ever since I've known him, he's had a desire to uh, plant a church, and this is the year where they're going for it. Him and his family and a number of their friends who are here with him today are going to be planting Doxa Church in Orange Park, and it's our great pleasure to partner with you through Acts 29, and we've got a gift that we want to give to you, a check for $5,000 to help you guys out just a little bit. We know church planting ain't cheap. And we can't wait to see you guys make a difference. Give him one more big round of applause as he brings God's word to us today. Journey Church, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pastor Eric. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you and for you guys to be a part of what uh, God's doing with the planning of Doxa Church. It's a big deal um, that you guys, uh, it's not competition, but let's, let's work together. And so... I want you to know that our prayer is that when Journey Church wins, Doxa Church wins. And when Doxa Church wins, Journey Church wins. Because we're all about the same thing. We're on the same team that we exist to make disciples of Jesus, right? And proclaim the gospel and make disciples of Jesus. And so we're a part of that. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be able to be in uh, the pulpit and share with you from Psalm 127. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and go that way uh, to Psalm 127. If not, you can follow along on the screen. And uh, a little bit about myself, I've uh, been pastoring and shepherding for 17 years. Uh, I was student pastor for a long time and then did disciple making pastor and then have slowly made this journey into church planning. My wife is over here, Carrie, been married 16 years. We can clap that up. You're clapping for her, not for me, because you would, that would make sense if you knew me, right? What she has to deal with. And then my two boys, Blake and Caden, 12 and 9, are right there that God has given us and blessed us. So, but if you got a Bible, go ahead and to Psalm 127. I'm going to kind of get into nitty gritty and kind of just jump into the text. And so, if you'll do me the pleasure, stand up as we read the scriptures together. And uh, Psalm 127, and to provide a little bit of understanding, these are, this is one psalm of a group of psalms that uh, the Israelites would sing as they went up to the mountain to Jerusalem, and they would sing together as they go walk to Jerusalem to celebrate some of the festivals that they would enjoy uh, to go remember about the faithfulness of God. And so the people of God singing songs of God as they go spend time with God. And so it's not actually much different than us today is that as God's people, the local church come together, celebrate on a Sunday morning and submit ourselves to God as we listen to the scriptures that sometimes we need to sing, right? Sometimes we need singing. Sometimes we need listening. And here the psalm is dealing with is that the people of God are actually being exhorted and encouraged by Solomon uh, to remember that Lord's blessing all comes through and works through some effort by human beings. So if you got a Bible, verse 1, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Father, we thank you so much that you have spoken through the scriptures and we have the opportunity to know who you are and what you've done through Jesus Christ. But most beautifully and most importantly, we get to know who we really are. 
It's not who we think we are. It's not who the world says we are. It's not what our family says, our friends says, our Facebook feed, our Instagram feed. We know that our identity is defined by who you say we are. Thanks be to God that you saved us to make a new people, your people, God's people, to walk and journey in this world. So God, as we listen to the scriptures, may the truth just save our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So what gets you up out of bed in the morning? What causes you to go on that morning commute? Anybody uh, make that commute over the Buckman? Like there's a special opportunity for you to be prayed right here at the end of the sermon, right? Because it takes a lot of motivation to go through the Buckman, right, in that morning commute. What is the light at the end of the tunnel that pushes you through your week? What keeps you up late? What wakes you up early? We all have those things, right? There's something that motivates us. There's something that, that like, pushes this desire inside of us to do something, right? And to push through these painful things of getting out of bed because Lord knows some of us don't like to get up out of bed and we don't like to go to, go to bed late, but we like to go to bed early. But what motivates us? See, the Bible says that as this local church exists, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, chosen people. Good, wonderful news. But what makes us, as we hear these questions, different than anybody that stands outside the local church, anyone who says that they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they haven't trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, there's a difference between them and us when we experience these questions. Because our motivation is that, we're, that we as Christians, we as the local church, we are driven and we have desires and motivations not for something but from someone. Did you hear what I said? That we push through these questions and motivated to push through the day for different reasons than what the world and society pushes through the day and faces these questions, Right? is that our motivation and our desire is much different. That's what Solomon is saying in the text. In this psalm, we see him exhorting the people of God to remember that without the Lord's blessing, all human effort is in vain. That when we live and what we work and what we chase after and what we get out of our bed and what we stay late, the way that we do those things and our motivation is much, much different than society and culture is that we do this because we understand this. And here's what I'm praying all through the course of the week is that there's going to be spots in this text and then this sermon that is going to be offensive to you or even challenge the way that you are living right now. And my prayer is that you would understand this, that our motivation, our motivation to be prosperous or successful in life, that we know that that comes from God. It's a gift from God for us to enjoy, right? Not a God to be exalted. Is that we see in the text two big ideas. Is that our prosperity and success are gifts from God to be enjoyed, not a God to be exalted. Because we first see this. That our work without God is absolutely empty. It's absolutely vain. Look at verses 1 and 2 with me, will you? That Solomon is saying that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. He makes it very, very clear, right? That you can't, you work without God, your work is empty. Your work is meaningless. Your work is purposeless. As we, anybody that's a Christian or been about the local church or read the Bible, we know that Solomon likes this word vain. It's like chasing after the wind, as we see in Ecclesiastes. And so we see it marked in verses 1 and 2 three times that he makes it emphatically clear that work without God is absolutely meaningless and it's absolutely vain. And he uses two reminders for us. First, he sees in verse 1, what? A builder and a watchman. 
Doesn't notice in the text, look back at your ver- look at your Bible, look back at the screen, is it doesn't say anything about what he's building. Doesn't say he's building a house, doesn't say he's building a tent, uh, doesn't say a temple, doesn't say a gate. It just says that he's building something. And it matters not so much of what you're building, it matters who you are building with. Did you hear what I said? It matters not what you build, but who you build with. And he makes it emphatically clear, even going a step further, that he uses the illustration of a watchman. In the, in the ancient times, a watchman would stand and watch over the city. He would have to be vigilant to keep an eye on the horizon to make sure that there was no imminent danger that would be coming to and to take, overtake the city. But the truth is this, that, that God, in this text, and what Solomon says, it doesn't say not to build a house, right? It doesn't say that the watchman shouldn't watch. It says that you should do these things, but you should not do them without God. Some of us work like this. Some of us live our lives like this, right? Is that we get so caught up in our work that we worship our work rather than the God who gave us work. Did you, like work is not some byproduct of sin. Did you know that? That God gave you in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that you and I were made in the image of God. And then Genesis 2, 15, we hear that God gives Adam a role and responsibility to watch over the garden and to name the animals and do exercise dominion. And so work is something that God gave us so that we could image who God is. And what happens is that some of us look at our work and we worship work as God. We exalt it to God and we lay down our lives for it. And some of us are actually workaholics. That you came in here this morning and you're still thinking about what happens on Monday. You still think about what's going on on Tuesday, and that you live your life by this amazing little piece of technology, but you exalt it over your head because you think that work email or that text message from your boss or that coworker matters more than this present moment. And you match what the psalmist is saying in verse 2, this idea of being a workaholic. Look at verse 2 with me. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. So we work and we build houses and we watch over cities and we do it without God. And here's what the exercise plan for a workaholic is. They wake up early, they go to late to rest, right? It's, it's this picture of absolute exhaustion. Pouring your life out for your work because it's almost like a worship song. That you're exalting this idea that you think if you work harder, that your life is going to be absolutely complete and satisfied. And look what the psalmist says. He says this. Verse 2, it says that they wake up. This is the exercise plan. They They wake up early. They go late to rest. But look at the next part. Eating the bread of anxious toil. So a workaholic is getting up early, going to bed late, and then look what they're eating. I have two kids, as I've just mentioned a little bit earlier, and we have had the opportunity to go to Disney World. Anybody like Mickey Mouse? A couple of you people that are really serious. And uh, Mickey Mouse, do you know that's a brave trip? That's a super brave trip for a parent, right? It's actually a painful trip too, right here. Not, not, Not that, but the wallet right there. But you go to Disney World or you go to the Clay County Fair um, and you have children, they're going to ask you for food, right? That's just kind of a given. I mean, if you got toddlers, they ask for food every like three seconds, right? And so you go to these places and I can go and my kids tell me they're hungry. And you know what they ask? Hey, can we get something to eat? Sure. What do you want to get? Cotton candy. Hold on. You said you're hungry, right? I thought you said you were hungry. I, like we can have pizza, we have chicken fingers, you want cotton candy. Because cotton candy, for some reason, they think is going to fill them up, right? feels like it's going to satisfy. And it doesn't satisfy. Look what he says. The, eating the bread of anxious toil. 
that you eat your work. That's what he's picturing. You eat your work, you get worked up about your work, you're anxious about your work, you're concerned about your work, and you're eating it and it's empty and it's vain. That you and I take work, a God-given gift to us, and we make it a God. Some of you in this room, that you are laboring so hard, you're exhausting yourself so hard because you think that your success and your prosperity in life is by your own doing rather than a gift from God. And what the psalmist says is that these things, this toil, the same word that's used in Genesis 3.16, this picture of just toiling and working hard to exhaust ourselves, it's absolutely empty and vain. And he moves on and says, for this reason, truly he gives his beloved rest. Truly God gives his beloved sleep. It's God gifting and supplying to his people. And it's this moment where you can work and work and work and you can watch and you can watch and you can watch, hoping that you're going to accomplish or achieve something that God wants to give you. That the psalmist is pointing us to the fact that God gives good gifts. Every good gift is from above. But look what he says, beloved, sleep. How do you know that your work without God is empty? Is that you don't actually rest and sleep. You know why God gave us sleeping? It's a reminder that we are finite and we are not infinite. It's a reminder that we are man and he is God. And he supplied it for the fact of this reason, that our resting and our sleeping is actually an act of worship and faith. Did you know that? That when we work so hard and work all the time and we do it without God, that our sleep isn't really sleep. That you're restless and you're stirring around and you're worried about what's next or what I need to do. And God has brought you here today to remind you that your work is not something to be worshipped. It's not a God that's going to bring you success or prosperity. God wants you to turn your, from that sin. And he wants you to turn your face to the fact that you can come to him. Come to him. Come to him. And find sleep and rest. Because it's an act of faith. That when you put your head on your pillow and then you rest those eyes, it's you saying, I trust you, God. I trust that I am your own. I am your child. I know that you know all things and that you're watching all of my life. And everything that happens, happens according to the counsel of your goodwill. It's you being able to have sleep and rest in that. And a life of work that's empty is a life of work without God. Second is, th is this, is that we notice that how do you know that you're work, working with God? Look at verses 3 through 5. It says this, Behold, children are heritage from the Lord, the fruit of a wo the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. So he moves from the picture of really making a drastic change, right? So we talked about, he talked about builders, he talked about watchmen. And now he's talking about something that is a beautiful picture of this thing that we call the family. A verse that we're many, many of us are familiar with, maybe in child dedications. But he moves us to this point to illustrate the truth of life. The truth remains the same. Work without God is meaningless. And he uses this illustration of the family to show us. Look at two words in the text with me in verse 3. It says, children are a heritage from the Lord. So it's translated better in the Hebrew as an inheritance. It's this picture that God is putting a deposit in the family, something that God does, not something achieved by you and I, but something that actually is done for us by God. That when ch God gives children, he gives them to you as a gift. But the strange thing about the text is, is we have one clause where it says God gives this inheritance children, but look at the next part of it. It's, it's, it's astonishing and, and makes me think when I read it. The fruit of a, the womb, a reward. So 
It's actually like rewards are not something that are gifted to you. They're something that are earned, right, by you. And so we deal with one of the great tensions of Christianity and the Christian life. We deal with the idea of the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility of man. And this, this is controversial. Did you know that? Like when you mention the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility, that you think that has the same controversy for you as the Jaguar-Patriot game last season, right? Because some of you are still bitter about that, right? And good news is there's hope, right? New season, new opportunity, little redemption coming up in September. But this tension between the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. Let's be clear. God owes, owes us nothing. Do you, do you believe that? Like making sure this is what it means to be Christian, right, is to identify the fact all of us are sinners by nature and choice. We don't earn anything. Anything that we get that God gives us is a blessing, right? So God owes us absolutely nothing than God doesn't give children to some parents because they have good morality, they're good Christians, and they listen to Caleb, right? That's not why God gives some people children. So fertility isn't an issue of merit, but God's gift, right? And this is where it's terribly difficult for some of you. As I looked and thought and prayed and got to this verse, I knew that this, wound, this, is, a, this is a wound in, in your soul. It's very difficult, is that you see on a Facebook feed or an Instagram all these friends and family that maybe have children and you do not. You don't have kids. You want kids, and you feel like God's punishing you because you haven't been able to conceive and have a child. And there's been nights where you've stayed up late having this struggle, struggling conversation and, and difficult conversation with your wife or your, this husband about the reality that they have not been able to conceive and you feel like God's punishing you and you feel like your infertility is some, some kind of demerit given to you by God. And I don't know why. My heart breaks. If you are in this room and you desperately want to have a child but you cannot, and I'm not sure that I have any encouragement to you than this, that God gives and he gives as he chooses. And that we have to take the same, you have to take that same obsession to have a child and you have to take that obsession and move it towards God and go to him as your father. And you come to him and say, Lord, I don't understand why you haven't given us a child. But Lord, help me, give me faith to trust you. Give me faith to believe and trust you. It's a hard prayer to pray, isn't it? It's a terribly difficult prayer to pray. And that children, those of you that have children, that if you do have children, God is entrusted to you to do what verse four is saying. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. He moves to the point where he's not saying that your children are weapon, weapons to be used against someone. And they're not weapons that God get, is using against you, though it feels that way, right? You ever been to a Target? <laughs> maybe, that's just me, maybe that's just me, but I feel like a, I, every time I go in there, can we get a Lego? Can we get something? Can we get something? All the time. And it, it's adults too, right? Obviously. Yeah, okay. They have this... One of the many dysfunctions uh, of family and marriage, right? But you, you see them, and God's given them to you, not for you to use them, but for you to steward them. This is, this is difficult, too, for, for some of you parents that want to fix your children. Or you have a wayward son or daughter, right? Is that you, you automatically want to go into fix-it fix mode, just like I do with my kids that want Legos at Target, Right? I want to go and fix it mode. And what we learn about this illustration with a warrior is a, a warrior is someone 
that looks at his arrows, his children, and looks at them and knows that it's a gift from God, and he says this, as he takes these hours and these days to become confident with the weapon, is that God gave you these arrows for you to steward. These children are a gift from God for you to steward. So it doesn't mean that you're controlling them, doesn't mean that you're trying to do things to make them become the human beings you want them to be. It's you being competent enough and skilled enough, like a warrior, to know the weapon, to know them. It's, and it requires you to spend time with them. Is that you quit pawning them off to be discipled by your television, and your, their tablet, or their telephone. It's, it's, that's not stewardship, that's abuse. If, I'm not saying that those things are evil. I know that many of you might be taken that way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we take something like that and we turn that thing that's good and we turn it into a God. And your kids are really good at it, but you're good at it too. And you're pushing them to worship something. But stewardship of your children, when you understand that they are from God, is that you're going to steward them differently than everybody else, right? Because you see that they're a gift from God. So here's two things that I think that can help you think about investing in that weapon and that quiver that God's given you. First is that you model faith and repentance. That your kids see mom and dad model faith and repentance. What are you talking about, pastor? That seems kind of weird. That seems very theological. I'm a nerd, so I like theological things. And so this is what it looks like as you steward those arrows in your quiver, is that you look at repentance as something that's not for the adults, but it's for anyone that's a human being. That you stop taking the situation when you talk to your wife and use a tone where you dishonor her in front of your children, it's you having the courage, men, to bring your kids back in the room, sit them down, have a family conversation, and you confess your sin in front of your kids and you honor your wife and say, I'm sorry for the way that I treated you. God gave you as a gift to me. I'm sorry I disrespected you. And you look at those little faces and you say, I'm sorry that I dishonored your mom. She is a gift from God to me for me to enjoy, not to manipulate. And that's what it looks like to steward your children as gifts, right? Nobody, that, that's, that's, I, I see you over there. I appreciate that. One, one of you are clapping. This is offensive to some of you. It's like, I don't know what to do with that. But in your proudness, you think that you can't expose your sin. And instead of people, your kids looking to you as this perfect people, you'll never point them to Jesus. Did you know that? If you are just going to live your life in this prideful arrogance to not even admit your sin in front of your kids... You are going to lead them from Jesus rather than lead them to Jesus. Did you know that? And that's what stewardship looks like. Or it's even this, what you pray and who you pray for. Is that you take that quiver and you, and you rally them at night and you start praying and pleading and pestering on their behalf with them for your neighbors that don't know Jesus. Is that they know that those people that you probably talked about in front of them, right? Man, I wish they'd mow their lawn. You've said all these things about them in front of your kids that you take your kids and you rally them around the circle and you start praying for the neighbors that you know are far from God. That's what it means to be a, a skilled warrior that looks at your children and develops them and disciples them into the people of God. And look how it concludes in verse 5. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So this is a picture of this older man that is unable to take care of himself. And he has enemies at the gate. But children stand in front and protect and provide security and care for their parents if they've been stewarded correctly that they'll actually be happy. Happy is the man who fills his quiver with them. So here, here's making sure that as we progress through the text, it's work without God is empty. Work with God and 
regard to children is full and flourishing, but he makes this affirmation, blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. It's not about just your kids providing security. It's what it feels like the psalm is supposed to do. Like, you're going to get old, right? We're going to get old. And I want my kids to take care of me. And I don't want them to put me in a nursing home if I don't have to go, right? And I want them to drive me around and get my prescriptions and push me around in the wheelchair at the Orange Park Mall for the glory of God. Amen? But that's not the point. It's not the point. It's a really cute idea, right? It's a terrible visual for me. I'm going to have to go to therapy this week and a couple surf sessions thinking about the idea of that being that old. But here's what... Here's what the text is saying, is that God gave you children and God gave you work to point your focus back to God. Every time you look at your child, it's an opportunity to look back to the God who gave it to you, that person to you. Every time you look at your work, that's an opportunity for you to look to the God who gave you that work. That's happy is the person, full is the person, the person's not empty, they're absolutely full when they understand that God has gifted them with so much. That your prosperity isn't something that's achieved by you, but it's something received from God to you. And as you're here this morning, I want you to pray these two things. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'll spe specifically want to talk to you that maybe you're experiencing infertility. You can't have a child. If you're here today, I want you to know that God loves you. God cares for you. And that, that wound that is on your heart, God wants to apply some salve on it right now. He wants not to put a Band-Aid on it. He wants to make you new and complete. And, and in that situation, I want you to know that you have an altar that's going to be filled with people that are probably going to be praying. But you grab a pastor, you grab a friend, and you come to the altar and ask God, God, help me to trust you. God, provide me a child. Ask in faith that God would give you a child. But you come to God and say, God, help me to trust you in this. This hurts. I don't understand it. Give me faith to believe you. If that is you, I want to challenge you that God still loves you. Go to God. Go to God. Go to God. If you're here today and you've idolized your work or you've looked at your children as a curse rather than a blessing, that you would repent of that. And that you would see that God has actually gifted you with those things for you to enjoy, to exalt him, and to make your motivation for looking at those things much different than the world so that they might see your life as different than society and culture. God, I pray that as we come here today, as we think about these things, Lord, I know that our motivations are just insulting. God, we think that we can achieve prosperity. We think that we can actually be successful. And God, our work is a gift from you. And everything that is good about it, everything that's prosperous, everything that's successful is a result of your mighty hand, not our own. God, help us to look at the gift of work and look at the gift of children as a blessing from your hand that we might steward for your glory and for the good of others May it be our joy to know that you have given us an opportunity to look at those things, to be reminded of the fact that you are a faithful God who does good things to his people and for his people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you put your hands together and thank Jeff for bringing forward God's word. If you're new, let me tell you how we're going to close. Would you rise with me? We're going to sing one more song together. and. As he kind of intimated, the altars are going to be open up here. If you would like to join hands with somebody in prayer, myself and other leaders will be up here. We would be honored to pray with you or for you over whatever you're going through. There's communion elements to both my left and my right, so you're welcome to come up and take communion. If you have a written prayer request, you can come up here and put it right in the God box. Or if you just need some alone time with God, there's altars up here that you can come up and kneel at. Let's spend just a couple more moments worshiping him and then we'll dismiss. The altars are open.
kindness of mercy that born with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving see God you're so good in God you're so good in God you're so Oh 
Come on, church. Yeah. It's only through the cross. It's not by our own might. Highly favored anointed, filled with your power for the glory, Jesus' name. I am blessed, I am blessed, I am called. Come on. I am healed, I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on, fill this room with your worship this morning. God. enough for coming out and worshiping with us today. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about Docs at Church and how you might help, I'm sure Jeff will be up here at the front. If you're new to Journey, I'd love to meet you. Come on up and say hello before you go. And I hope to see you this coming Thursday night for a night of prayer and worship. God bless you all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he give you peace in Jesus' name. Have a great day, everybody.